Welcome to the Hope College Liberal Arts Lecture Series. This is our kind of third and final installment for this, um, this year's series. Uh, my name is Ryan White. I'm the director of First Year Seminar and uh, First Year Seminars in Academic Advising. Um, and I just wanna thank you for being here on this holiday week. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a busy time and I appreciate, um, appreciate your presence here and in this moment. Well, so we're here to discuss the liberal arts. Um, to hear a little storytelling, to maybe consider a little movement. Uh, and we're going to talk about, uh, and I want you to keep in mind, just kind of simple questions like, well, what are the liberal arts? Do they matter? Do they still matter? What's their purpose? How might the liberal arts shape a hope, education, or a life? Uh, the series is sponsored by the First Year Seminar Program. Uh, the Senior Seminar Program, our General Education Director, Chris Grunler who's over here, and our Associate Dean for Teaching and Learning. And it seeks to address some of those questions uh, I, just, uh, I just referenced. And the lectures are for campus as a whole, uh, but they're in particular for uh, first year seminar students who are kind of considering the purpose of their education as they work on that liberal arts essay, as well as senior seminar students as they kind of look back on their education as a whole. Well, it's my pleasure today to introduce our speaker, um, Hope's Dorothy Wiley DeLong, Professor of Dance, uh, Linda Graham. Uh, Linda holds a BFA uh, in theater and an MFA in choreography and performance from the University of Illinois. Uh, she's also studied at the National Academy of Dance in Champaign, Illinois. Linda is a um, former member of Dayton Contemporary Dance Company and has worked in New York City with various companies under the direction of uh, important choreographers such as Anna Sokolow, uh, Mary Anthony, Ulysses Dove, and Lynn Taylor Corbett. Professor Graham began here in 1983. Uh, and she's taught a variety of areas, including dance history, historical social dance, ballet, jazz, and others. And she's a person who likes to make connections, and you will hear that in her presentation. Um, one of the connections she's helped forge at Hope is a, a class that looks at dance and career skills. Um, that's kind of a, a, an interesting in, uh, uh, feat that that department engages in. Um, she co-founded and directed the Aerial Dance Theater, an affiliate of the Hope Department of Dance. And her award-winning work has been done near and far, countless productions, of students at Hope and in our um, Hope Summer uh, Rep, uh, as well as um, kind of, you can like do concentric circles when you look at her work. So she's gonna work with the Grand Rapids Ballet, with the Joffrey Ballet in Chicago, and, and, and her, choreograph her choreography has been all over the world, including on, um, on television. Um, in Hope's philosophy of education, we state uh, this, that a liberal education within the Christian tradition also seeks to develop the whole person by infusing education with purpose and direction. And I think Professor Graham is a great model of that integration of purpose and direction. And as I kind of prepped my introduction of her, and I was kind of reading through her bio, and, and I know her, and we've spoken, and we've worked together, um, I just felt like I wasn't like capturing like the heart uh, that she brings to things. So I asked some of her colleagues that know her better than I do, like, well, what do you if you were introducing Linda, what do you, what do you think of? Um, and this is what Matt Farmer, associate professor of dance, prior student of Professor Graham's said. He said, when I think of Linda, the first thing that comes to mind is an individual who is keenly aware of the connection between the mind, the body, and the spirit. Her ability to articulate these connections is not only at the heart of a liberal arts education, but also at the heart of a faith-filled education. Her ability to see and act on the interconnections between academia and the possibility for a better society and world is something to be admired. And in my humble opinion, needs to be replicated more often by fellow academics. Lastly, she is a true artist and a lifelong learner. Her works have been commissioned by national dance companies and her continual curiosity keeps her work fresh and present. Her talk uh, this afternoon is, is entitled the, the Necessary Art of the Liberal Arts. And just to kind of give you a, a framework of our time, uh, Professor Graham's gonna present for 30 minutes or so. We'll hopefully, we'll have some time for, for Q&A, but 
um, to honor uh, any class commitments. No matter what, we will we will uh, end this session uh, prior to, to 150. So uh, you should hopefully be able to uh, to stay for the duration. So uh, please join me in welcoming Professor Linda Graham. Matt said that I should have given him more A's. Um, so it's a, a real pleasure to be here with you today. Um, uh, please bear with my fumbling. This is the fourth PowerPoint presentation I've done in my life. Normally, I'm just out. You know, I'm out here doing that. So, um, so thank you again for coming. Thank you for that incredible introduction, Ryan. Um, and good afternoon. Before you leave today, I. And if you bear with me, I truly hope that you will leave more confident and connected than when you first walked in. Just how will this eventually increase your earning power? That part, I'm not going to, you know, I'll back away from that. But I do know that if you leave more confident and more connected, you're going to have a better day. And that's a good thing. Every good event. I start here, anyway. Every good event begins with a prayer. And this one is by Thomas Morton, Sir Merton, so if you could, with me. My Lord God, I have no idea where I'm going. I do not see the road ahead of me. I cannot know for certain where it will end. Nor do I really know myself. And the fact that I think that I am following your will does not mean that I am actually doing so. But I believe that the desire to please you does, in fact, please you. And I hope I have that desire in all that I am doing. I hope that I will never do anything apart from that desire. And I know that if I do this, you will lead me by the right road, though I may know nothing about it. Therefore, will I trust you always, though I may seem to be lost and in the shadow of death. I will not fear, for you are ever with me and you will never leave me to face my perils alone. Amen. When Jonathan Haygood first asked me to do this presentation, um, he said, you can begin with saying, you know, telling them a little bit about yourself and your experience and your history with the liberal arts. So I went back in my head and did a little reflection and, um, oh, here we go. The, the PowerPoint challenge. Oh, there, that was the prayer. Here. I learned to see the world as an artist from a biologist. When I was 11 years old, I was enrolled in a nature experience summer day camp. One of the teachers was a biologist, a woman named Mrs. Lindsay. At the end of camp, we spent the weekend sleeping. I'm just going to do that because I don't have a place here to put them. So. Um, in what seemed to be the middle of the night, on this last night that we had in camp, Mrs. Lindsay woke us all up. She came in at like 2 o'clock in the morning to a bunch of 11 and 12-year-olds and said, get up, get up, get up, get up. You have to come outside. You have to see this. And she took us all outside, and we were like, uh -huh, and said, look at this tree. And we looked for the hundredth time at least at this old oak tree that stood in front of the cabin. And we all looked at it, and she said, what do you see? And we said, we see a stupid old oak tree. Can we please go back to bed? And she said, you must look again. And she turned on her flashlight, and not six feet in front of me was this, or something like it, a mama bat and her babies. When Mrs. Lindsay turned off the light, the bat and her baby were still clearly there. It's just that we hadn't been looking for that. We hadn't been seeing what was truly there. We had been looking for something that we thought was there. The lesson, don't see what you think is there, what once was there, what should be there, what could be there, what you want to be there, or what you expect. Rather, see what is. Do not be afraid. As Franciscan priest Richard Rohr says, God is hiding in plain sight. We may look, but often we do not see because of the confetti that we bring to our own party. But if you can see, truly see what is, then you can make a good informed decision. The bottom line, 
I'm a better artist because of what I learned from a biologist. Before I knew what the liberal arts were, I was learning in a liberal arts way. Now, a little more about myself. I'm not from Holland. I'm not from West Michigan. I'm not from Michigan. I did not graduate from Hope College. I didn't graduate from a liberal arts institution. Both of my degrees are FAs, meaning that they're fine arts or conservatory degrees. The conservatory track started early for me. When I was 12, I auditioned for and was accepted to a residential ballet conservatory called the National Academy of Dance in Champaign, Illinois. My high school involved three hours of academics per day, followed by six to seven hours of intensive dance study. Two hour ballet classes, followed by point, followed by variations, followed by rehearsals, and then performances in addition to that, starting at the age of 12, like I said. Um, we didn't have a football team. I'm, I'm, where am I? Does this show up? No, anyway, I'm the one like in the far back whose head you can't see, because I'm tall. So, <laughs> it was put me back there. Um, so we didn't have a dance company. Uh, we did have a dance company. We didn't have a football team. We didn't have prom. We toured Giselle. But when graduation time came, instead of following the route of so many of my academyite peers and joining a professional company at 17, I quit dancing. It's really hard work. You sweat a lot. The hours are bad. The pay is worse. This probably wasn't worth it. And I went into the BFA program in theater at the University of Illinois. For some reason, I thought that was better. Um, I had heard about college and figured the hours and the pay might be better in theater. The schedule of a conservatory acting program was in line with what I had experienced at the academy. 12-hour days in the theater are the norm. What was surprising to me were these required extra classes that I had never experienced before, things in sociology and psychology. What? Um, about half for the fine arts degree of what you are required to do for gen eds here in the liberal arts. Um, they were fun, they were interesting, they were not my focus, but still they sometimes engaged me. My education overall disciplined, trained, and honed my performance art through strict conservatory principles and expectations, all of which I never really fully felt like I quite belonged to. One of my teachers later informed me that I had too much of my own mind. I was too curious, she said. And in retrospect, there was a part of me that sought the kind of balance in my life that would work for who I am. Although I had heard of the liberal arts, I never concerned or considered them as a serious direction of study because after all, you work really hard, you sweat hard, the hours are bad, the pay is worse, right? Uh, but suffice to say, I did end up at Hope College. That's a whole other story. I was not planning to stay, and as Ryan said, this is my, uh, I started in 1983, which makes this my 34th year, which is why Matt Farmer has been my student, and Nikki Flynn back there, everybody. Um, I got here, I moved here from New York City, and I thought this campus was just the fine arts campus. I assumed that the rest of the institution was right where it should be, which was by the lake, because nothing could be this small. I did not fit in here. At the beginning of my second year, I met an artist named Billy Mayer, um, who you've probably heard of recently. He was an artist and fellow funky junior faculty member. He and his wife wrapped their hospitable arms around me and introduced me to what was to become my tribe of people here. I found a place that I belonged to. As you may know, Uncle Billy recently passed away. He will be missed. Badly. Earlier this semester, I know Dr. Tyler provided you all with a thorough history of the liberal arts. Where they came from, what they do, the cogitate, etc. It was dazzling. He was dazzling. I watched that video. Uh, trivium and quadrivium. I confess to some annoyance that music got the top billing uh, when it came in there for the arts. But then I remember that in other cultures, the word for music is the same as the word for dance, and they are essentially synonymous. So there's some comfort in that thought for me. Um, as you may realize by now, I am a convert to the power of the liberal arts education. 
I have witnessed how this education provides the foundation for a life prepared to change and evolve with a fully informed perspective and compassionate insight. Through the liberal arts, you are prepared to act in all situations with calm wisdom, to pause and breathe and think and choose. Think about that. Inhale, exhale. That's not really true. Now, you're, you're going to be like freaking out about like anybody else in the future. At some point, you will. But the liberal arts experience is like Mrs. Lindsay's flashlight. You already have it. Here, you learn to turn it on and shine it on that oak tree to see what is truly there, to not be afraid and to choose. As David Foster Wallace said in his epic speech, this is water, and this is a long quote, which would never be allowed in any paper that most of my students write, but it's a really worthy quote. So I hope if you have not seen this particular video of David Foster Wallace, this is water, I encourage you to view the entire, the entire speech. The only thing that's capital T true is that you get to decide how you're going to try to see it. You get to consciously decide what has meaning and what doesn't. You get to decide what to worship. But here's something else that's true. In the day-to-day -day trenches of adult life, there's actually no such thing as atheism. There is no such thing as not worshiping. Everybody worships. The only choice we get is what to worship and an outstanding reason for choosing some sort of God or spiritual type thing to worship be it JC or Allah, be it Yahweh or the Wiccan Mother Goddess or the Four Noble Truths or some infrangible set of ethical principles, is that pretty much anything else you worship will eat you alive. If you worship money and things, if they are where you tap real meaning in life, then you will never have enough. Never feel you have enough. It's the truth. Worship your own body and beauty and sexual allure, and you will always feel ugly. And when time and age start showing, you will die a million deaths before they finally plant you. On one level, we all know this stuff already. It's been codified as myths, proverbs, cliches, bromides, epigrams, parables, the skeleton of every great story. The trick is keeping the truth up front in daily consciousness. Worship power? You will feel weak and afraid, and you will need ever more power over others to keep the fear at bay. Worship your intellect, being seen as smart, you will end up feeling stupid, a fraud, always on the verge of being found out, and so on. Look, the insidious thing about these forms of worship is not that they're evil or sinful, it is that they are unconscious. They are default settings. Author and shame researcher Brene Brown explores a similar idea when she discovers, discusses how we live in a culture of perceived scarcity, what she calls our culture of never enough. What is meant by the phrase of default settings? According to Merriam-Webster online dictionary definition 5a, default means a selection made usually automatically or without active consideration due to lack of viable alternative. It's your go-to, the habitual pattern that you've developed over your lifetime. Sometimes it's obvious. You get in your car and you drive to work on Saturday morning when you meant to go shopping. You just went on default. You went it up there. Whoa, what are you doing at the office? Um, but it can be far more subtle. Someone critiques your work and you find yourself weeping or getting angry. They haven't said anything awful, but the circumstance puts you in a reactionary place of shame or pain due to prior experience. That's been trained into you and you are responding to what was, not what is. We all have our defaults. That go-to is sometimes quite useful, even life-saving under certain circumstances, but it can also undercut us at just the wrong moment. An old pattern for a new situation doesn't always serve. Can you make the choice? Can you change your destiny? Can you define and defy your default? Seeing what that oak tree for what it is. Not what you expected, thought, assumed, or hoped. The liberal arts prepares you to choose something other than that default, and that's what I find most remarkable. This is incredibly important. We live in a world where we have access to anything we want, 
anytime you want it, and it comes customized. It comes at 3 p.m. or 3 a.m. You can have it delivered to your door. You can be wearing your jammies, and it doesn't matter what the weather is. It shows up. We, we don't have inconvenience to ourselves in this world. The extent of our physicality is increasingly here, tiny, small, not here, looking out. Hang on to that. I'm going to come back to that. You're all spread out. We're going to come back to that pretty soon. Um, technology has seismically realigned how we interact with the world. It's becoming, for many, the default. Over the last two years, various studies have emerged indicating that tweens and teens spend six to nine hours per day online. That's 42 to 63 hours per week. And yet, in this embarrassment of informational riches, we live lives of scarcity. As Brene Brown says, the last thing we think before we go to bed is that we didn't get enough sleep. And the first thing we think when we wake up in the morning is that we didn't get, wait, I had that backwards. Flip that back, rewind, rewind. The, last, the first thing we think when we go to bed at night is that we didn't get enough done. The first thing we think when we wake up in the morning is that we didn't get enough sleep. It's never enough. How many likes did you have today on your Instagram and your Facebook? Was it enough? And for all the socialness of our social media, we yearn for real connection. Why? Because the screen has no imperative for a shared experience. Our sense of space, time, weight, and body are minimized. Our bodies and minds are not served with either corporeal or mental challenge or diversity in thought, culture, politic, place, or preference. We are not required to consider, feel, empathize, or stretch. In this disconnected world, the liberal arts invites us to remember that we are bound together by a common humanity and to see our fellow humans with perspective, generosity, and curiosity, not suspicion and fear. We must champion the thoughtful, creative, and physical experience. This is what I so appreciate about the liberal arts education here at Hope College. Your physical experience is required. The creative experience is, for you, required. Your field of vision is broadened, and the liberal arts education with here at Hope College, with that, you are not destined to click default. I'm going to focus for a moment on those two relatively unique items in the liberal arts education here at Hope, creativity and physicality. Creativity, number one. Yes, creative thinking. When I first started teaching my senior seminar course called Leap of Faith, which includes components of physicality and creativity, and please don't tell John, oh, I probably shouldn't let you know. We play. We play a lot. We play, we juggle, we play. Um, I had seniors shyly approach me at the, at the beginning of the semester, and they were muttering things like, Professor Graham, I'm an accounting major, so I'm not creative, only to have them think turned around and they offered some of the most fabulously imaginative, creative presentations I have ever seen. I suppose they wanted me to think that this was all beginner's luck, but I don't buy that. No one ever creates something perfect the first time. The only one who does that is God. But I do understand the fear of judgment, shame. Sometimes it's just safer not to call it creativity. Our culture celebrates creativity and condemns it in one breath. According to Brene Brown, creativity is where as many as 80% of the adult population have experienced shaming, where most feel incredibly vulnerable. Creativity is also the key to play, innovation and resiliency. And creativity is not benign. Human beings are innately creative, and if they don't do something creatively constructive, more often than not, they'll do something constructively destructive. Dogs, it's like my dogs. I had to get them in here somehow. Um, kind of like my energetic, intelligent, and inherently devious, you can see it, dogs. Being positively creative is one of the keys to living a wholehearted life. To act upon creativity, one must have access and skill in a medium in order to produce and share it. The craft of the discipline that serves creativity can be learned. Here, in the liberal arts of Hope College, you are required to at least explore one artistic experience in your FA2. This is not going to make you a creative genius. That requires inspiration. But it will make you 
better because it gives you the tools. Through training and practice, you can, even on a modest level, learn to be more comfortable with risk and creativity. This also requires faith. We all understand duality, black and white, this or that, right or wrong thinking, certainty. But trust, faith, leaves space for uncertainty, mystery, ambiguity, and ultimately, creativity. The faith to let go of outcomes opens the door to innovation and possibility. Such faith allows for hope. Such faith allows for discovery. You have to be willing to accept uncertainty if you're going to be creative or innovative, artistic or scientific. And now, a word about physicality. The sea squirt. The sea squirt is a small creature of the ocean who, if you reach out to touch it, will squirt you in the eye like your morning grapefruit. After the ability to squirt you in the eye, squirts are probably most famous for eating their brains, kind of like self-inflicting zombies. What happens isn't quite as drastic as it sounds, but the sea squirt life cycle is nonetheless extreme and fascinating. Sea squirts start life off as eggs that develop into tadpole-like larvae with about 300 neurons, giving it a tiny kind of little brain that qualifies it as a chordate. The free-swimming tadpole larvae stage lasts a short time since they aren't capable of feeding in that state. The tadpoles quickly attach themselves to something, cementing themselves headfirst to the spot where they will spend the rest of their lives. They need to feed immediately, so an amazing transformation begins. The sea squirt turns around and it eats its own tadpole-like parts. It absorbs its twitching tail. It eats its primitive eye. It eats its spine-like notochord. And finally, it eats the rudimentary little 300 neuron brain, thereby demoting itself biologically. The sea squirt has become the ultimate conch potato. That's the bad pun of the... Here's the takeaway. Because the sea squirt no longer needs to swim around or interact with the world in any but most, the most passive capacity, it no longer requires a brain. Because it moved, it had a brain. Recent studies in cognitive neuroscience support the link between the movement necessary for navigation, getting from here to there, and psychological processes such as memory, imagination, adaptability, and overall brain development. Ergo, and with some apologies to my philosophy colleagues, perhaps Descartes' philosophical insight would be more accurate were to be modified. I move, therefore I think, therefore I am. Movement is a defining characteristic of being alive. We spend our lives in motion, yet rarely pause to reflect about on how our own motion both expresses who we are and defines us. Anyone who has ever been physically limited through accident or some other unexpected event understands how the sudden inability to physically move in the way to which one is accustomed causes one to undergo a renegotiation of self-identity, often accompanied by grief and depression. And certainly, anyone who has been at the bedside of a loved one who passes away or found a recently deceased body or attended the funeral of a friend or family member as anyone who has experienced these sad circumstances knows, whether intuitively or consciously, the very stillness of that previously breathing human body disquiets us to the bone, even as it defines death. Movement is essential to our humanity. Most of communication happens non-verbally. Statistics indicate that anywhere from 55 to as much as 90% of what we communicate is shared through body language, but the difference made up by pitch and tone, and finally, actual words communicate somewhere between five to seven percent of what we intend to share. The takeaway here is that most communication happens non-verbally, but historically in academe and increasingly in our technological society, there's a heavy exclusive reliance on words, emails, texting, Twittering, Instagram, and Snapchat. We take the nonverbal out of the formula leaving us with a lot to misunderstand, misconstrue, and misuse. How much of the current political divisiveness and frustration with civil discourse is grounded in this shift of how we choose to communicate? Did you know that how you move actually influences how you think? For example, if you smile when you are sad, 
The simple act of using your smile muscles, your zygomaticus, will lift your spirits. Um, how many of you have a pen available right now? Pull it up, hold it up. Be proud. Hold up your pen. Hold up your pen. Good, 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 good. Good. Now, those of you with that pen, put it in your teeth, right? right? Okay. Excellent. Good. Now, look around the room. And now everybody's smiling because they're seeing you with a pen in your mouth and you've got, you know, you're using it. Yeah. Good. Excellent. Thank you very much. A little applause, please, for our participants with the pens. That took a little courage. They were not there. They were vulnerable. Um, so, uh, they, but that lifted your moment, right? Amy Cuddy, in her extraordinary TED Talk, Your Body Language Shapes Who You Are, discusses this even further. In it, she explains that when you hold a superhero pose, you change yourself physiologically. It increases your testosterone, your confidence, and this is for both men and women, and it decreases your cortisol or your stress hormone. Superhero poses, if you take a look at them, they're fantastic. Any of you see the recent Thor movie? Funny stuff. Very funny. No, okay. Anyway, um, there. if you look at them, these are very open poses. They're very vulnerable poses. They're also very grounded. Even though Thor is in the air up there, he's got the leg back, he's got a grounding. And they're also taking up a large kinosphere, that space around us. Now, part of that is because they've got weapons. Yes, okay, so their weapon takes up some kinosphere. But you don't have to have a weapon to take up a large kinosphere. You just need to stand up and be open with the body and look out and see what's out there instead of in here. The opposite of this, in contrast, is a fearful pose. A guarded, diminished pose. It's small. Going into small, diminished poses actually increases cortisol levels. Stress, fearfulness, and anxiety are increased with the rise of cortisol, that hormone. So consider the position we assume by default when we get on our phone. We spend a lot of time on our phones. That puts us in this diminished, guarded pose unknowingly is our default. So I have to ask myself, no study's been done on this, by the way, but I'm just observing as a dancer. I have to ask myself, how does this influence our physiology long term? What's going on with our hormones, our cortisol hormone, when we assume a fearful position which influences our cortisol, increases it, increasing our fearfulness, increasing our anxiety, increasing all of those things. Um, it increases our fundamental self as a result. A study has not been done, like I said, uh, if, anybody, uh, if anybody out there wants to do one, I, I'd really be up for that. Help, help you. I'll help you do that. Um, so, let's pull a bunch of these threads together. Uh, this is the interactive liberal arts exploration of your day. Um, I'm going to need to make music now. Okay. Uh, here are a bunch of different poses. Superhero voguing for you to do. Um, I'm going to put on some music, and if you would please strike four superhero poses. The music is short, it's only a little over a minute. At the end of your posing, and, and these are some examples, so you have no excuse. Everybody stand up. Stand up while we figure out the music here. Can you help me? Uh, escape. Escape. Okay, you're going to see my... Uh, oh, there we go. Good. And... Are you ready? Four, pick four. Now, at the end of this, what I want you to do is that you're near somebody. You're near like a human being, right? You're out there near a human being. What I'd like you to do is, I'm, I'm gonna borrow this young woman right here. What I'd like you to do, <laughs> thank you very much. Your name is? Beata. Thank you very much, Beata, for coming up and joining me on this. What I'd like you to do is near this person, you're, you're doing your superhero poses, whatever you're doing, fine. And um, at the end, you're going to take, at the end of the music, you're going to take their hand, and we're all just going to lift our hands up together. Okay? Ready? <laughs> I think you can do it. You can do it. There's no right or wrong. It's just doing it. Okay. And I'm back. We'll put on the music. And, oh, by the way, when you do that, when we just now touched hands, and I know my hand is so cold. My husband thinks I'm like a zombie. But um, uh, when you do that, you actually are increasing oxytocin. It's another cortisol. It's also known as the bliss hormone uh, because it increases connection and what else? Anybody else? I, I'm trying to remember. It, it incre I know it, it increases your connection. It's bonding. It's a bonding hormone. So you bond to the person next to you. It increases connectivity. So here we go. 
and a little Thor, not weird things happen, although that could happen too. Um, Thor. That one. No, I want this one. There. The music video. And now we have to get this. This. Options. Go! Come on, people! It's all about shining the light on that old oak tree. See the unexpected beauty that is truly there. Stand tall. Do not be afraid. Do not choose default. Choose wisely. God is hiding in plain sight. Thank you. Yeah, dance is. Dance is intentional. It's, it's not got an objective of necessarily being competitive, although that's where a lot of popular dance does happen. It can be competitive. Um, but there's some different intentionality about it. Uh, interestingly enough, there have been studies done that have looked at that very difference. You know, what's the impact in the brain and um, development and things like that. And I, I know that with older populations, um, the the, the, the dementia, the development of dementia is reduced by <coughs> dance where it doesn't necessarily happen when they are uh, swimming or running or doing uh, uh, physical activity of that sort. Dance is uh, not just intentional, but especially if you're doing social dance, it's social, it's musical, it's creative, it's physical, it's constantly changing. So it requires this kind of uh, development of multiple pathways in the brain that gives you ways to, to find your way through. So instead of having one route to get from here to there, your brain learns to take multiple routes. Um, my colleague in the back, Ms. Nikki Flynn, thank you so much for putting me, Nikki, um, is actually really quite well versed in some of these developmental differences. Would you have anything to add, Nick? I would just say another component for just the social emotional connection is a lot deeper in the creative experience um, and the opportunity to provide choices and more play. Um, we're playing, but it has with the intention, on intention, <laughs> in the dance experience versus maybe the sports event. Yeah, that's one of the defining characteristics <laughs> of play, I think, right? Yeah. That play is something that you don't have to do, but it is something that while you're doing it, you lose track of time. Um, it's got a lot of benefits. We need to play more often, actually, and play creatively. I just say also, like the, she talked about the neural pathways and being able to connect it, that we have opportunities to con make connections to lots more things versus in a dance class. Yeah. And we're making connections to the cognitive, the social, the physical, the affective, personal component, too. That's cool. 
quite a rich experience. <coughs> Any questions? So I don't know if it would be necessarily a requirement. Um, yes. But I would like to ask. <laughs> Speaking from a totally unbiased point of view. <laughs> As a mathematician, I've heard people do that. Okay. Well, and, and actually, um, uh, math is, uh, when I did my fine arts um, education at the University of Illinois, being in the fine arts, it was math and language that were not required for me to take. And in retrospect, I wish they had been. Um, I think it's, it's a, a very, I, I think math is the, the science of patterns. It's the science of patterns. And when we're dancing and playing creatively, we're, we're playing creatively with patterns. That's exactly what we're dealing with. So they're, they're highly integrated. <coughs> integrated they're, they're and nice. Not to take away from Linda's presentation, but I just had a student write a 40 page paper on how to use creative movement and dance through Fibonacci numbers and Pascal's triangle in the spiral. So it's pretty phenomenal. I can give it over to you. <laughs> wow. Yeah, wow. this is really great. <laughs> I would like to see hope change its curriculum in order to do the kinds of things you're talking about better for how students I don't know if it has to change the curriculum so much as it is maybe to be with the content okay. of what's going on. <coughs> yeah. um, I, don't, I, I have to think about that more. I think there's, we, we know more about how um, important these things are, and, um, and as we learn more about that, to integrate them into classes. Because I, I mean, I think that I think movement could easily be integrated into any math class or biology classes. When was the last time you did the meiosis, mitosis, square dance? It is possible, right? Or you can stand up and physically do Fibonacci numbers in class and then suddenly everybody understands it. Once you have a kinesthetic experience with something, you, you own it, you know it in a deeper way, you know it in your muscles. But that's true for all aspects of, of how we learn. So I, I'm very fond, I teach historical social dance and dance history survey, and anybody who ever takes that class with me knows that I have everybody move. Because for me, history moves in our bones and muscles. The fact that we shake hands with the right hand, has to do with history. It doesn't have that, do you guys know why we do that? No, What? Because you're showing you don't have a gun. You're showing you don't have a gun, or a sword. Because, again, it's the right hand, because where would you wear a sword? Everybody stand up, where would you hold your sword? Go ahead, your, foot, your fencing ball, your sword. Yes! It's on your left hip. It's on your left hip. If you have the right hand, you're either left-handed, or you're going to cut yourself in half. Thank you very much. Very nice. Very nice. Very nice. Um, so we shake hands with the right hand, like that. We shake hands with the right hand to show that we don't have a sword. The Latin word for left is what? Sinister, sinistra. Ooh, it's a great thing. I'm left handed. So, so I'm going to ask this lovely lady. Good. And with Liana here, why is it sinister? It's because if I'm showing her I have no weapon, but I'm left handed, I could easily go like that. <laughs> now, we're not walking around with this and pose on the left hip. We're not necessarily doing, you know, we don't have this. This idea of left, these knees, the right, etc. Nonetheless, we have inherited this tradition. So we continue to shake hands with the right hand as a demonstration of that we come in peace, that this is, we are people of goodwill, that we are people of goodwill. And this is something that we've inherited from our distant past. We are walking in our history. We live in it. It's in our skin, it's in our bones, it's in our muscles. Um, to, to be able to experience it and analyze it with some understanding of that is terrific fun if you ever want to take a sort of social dance or dance history survey. Other questions? So I think that sort of thing can be done more. I think that pretty much anything that is taught can be physicalized in some way. Just as when we teach dance, we can find the map of the dance, we can find the pattern, we can find the biology. These things are, are all it's part of being a complete human. You're all there. One last question. One last question. How do you implement this type of community of living outside of class, the school session, like in the summer and after graduation? Like, how do you call that stuff? For you? Um, well, I think here you've already got like a foundation of how to play with it. I see.
say follow your curiosity. Just really follow your curiosity. If something captures you, then investigate a little bit more. And that's going to keep the world open. Um, there will be times in your life where your focus is going to be just on surviving sometimes. And, and then um, it, it doesn't have the, the play that you've got to play in your life and your heart somehow. That's fundamental to join.